Good afternoon, good people. I hope you had an amazing lunch break and you managed to visit our exhibitors booth and silent auction and participated in the fun. Let me take this opportunity to introduce to you our next topic. As most of us know, Johannesburg is one of the largest metropolitans in Africa. It is known for its massive urban development and hustle and bustling nature. Today we are excited to host James Delaney, who is going to show us how birds and art have restored the world, an inner city sanctuary in Johannesburg's urban jungle. James is a South African artist working across multiple disciplines that include painting, drawing, printmaking, sculptures in the Victoria Yard near downtown Johannesburg. The floor is yours, James. Hello, I'm James Delaney. I'm going to be sharing my story about Revitalizing the Wilds, which is a large park next to downtown Johannesburg, which is a rather mad project, which I started very small, in very small ways about seven or eight years ago, and it's grown really big and become really successful. So I wanted to share some of my stories and also make them make it relevant to birders, because I think the wilds has an amazing ecosystem, which must attract a great variety of bird life. I put some slides together so I can show you nice pictures of what the wilds looks like for those who haven't been. And I've also titled the presentation, How 67 Birds Helped Turn the Wilds Around, because there was a pivotal moment four years ago where birds came to the rescue. And you're a group of birders, I thought you might appreciate that. So the wilds straddles the ridges that run east-west in Johannesburg. It's just north of downtown. And downtown has poorer areas, poorer residential areas like Yeovil, Gilbra, Barrier, etc. And people from those areas don't have much access to green space. And most of them, I think, imagined the wilds was closed off to them. They didn't realize that it was a public space. And on the north of the wilds are wealthier residential areas. And people there often had a history of going to the wilds decades ago, but hadn't for a long time. They, they feared it. So it was this rather tricky meeting point um, in a way of rich and poor, but actually neither of them used the park. And it's a remarkable area. The, the ridges are very rocky. You can see how it used to look in the old days. This photograph is from the 1930s when the stone pathways had originally been laid out. And I've put in little labels so you can see what it used to look like at familiar landmarks now for those who, who know the wilds. The sundial up at the top, monkey lawn, bottom left, giraffe lawn, bottom right. This whole area now basically is under forest, apart from the lawns. So in the old days, it was rock, rocky outcrops and yellow high felt grasses. Um, the, the trees and plants were planted from the 1930s onwards. There was a great collection of plants donated to the wilds after the Empire Exhibition in the 1930s. And many of those plants are still part of the plant collection now. And it was planted up over successive um, decades. Um, and now we have this, this glorious green space with this incredible diversity of plants. What is part of what's remarkable about the wilds is that it is all indigenous species. And in the old days, the colonial days, the administrators of spaces like this love to bring plants from all around the world. So you'd have an oak tree from England and a pine tree from North America. Um, that didn't happen in the wilds. It was always a celebration of, of indigenous plants. So it's a, a remarkable heritage. You can see from this photograph I took recently how it looks now and how altered the landscape is. It's declared a nature reserve, which I'm not convinced is the right term for it because it's obviously an, an altered or planted landscape. And you can see from the photograph here how, how incredible the, the tree cover is and great diversity of species and a great diversity of habitats as well. And for birders and anybody who appreciates wildlife, I think this does make it remarkable that you've got indigenous forest, you've got yellowwood forest and 
um, wild olive forest and all kinds of trees. So it's a, a place where forest birds can, can take refuge and um, find a happy life. Uh, bottom left, you've got grassland. The grassland is a thing which I've been working quite hard to protect because I think that it's, it's quite an overlooked part of the biome. Um, rocky outcrops, bottom right, most of the wild really is this. It's a mixture of different plants, a lot of succulents and aloes and things. Um, the soils have become deeper over time, so the, the plants have been able to, to grow better. Um, and there's a fair amount of water. You see top right, the ponds and streams. It's always a bit of a battle getting that whole system working. and It works sporadically, but when it does, it's obviously a great habitat for the water birds. But when I first stepped into the space, which was I think eight years ago, I got a dog, Pablo, who's quite well known in the park. And it just seemed mad to me that I was driving far, farther away to get to a park to take him for a walk when there was 40 acres next to me. And I spent a lot of time in New York and I've read the history of Central Park there. And that seemed to have some parallels for me because Central Park had been become overgrown and neglected and the people who bought the, the park stopped using it and it, it fell into disrepair. Um, and now it's, of course, one of the great parks in the world and incredibly well used by the people of New York. So I, didn't, I wasn't thinking kind of that ambitiously. I just thought, here's an overlooked space and Central Park used to be like that. So, you know, how scary can it be? And let me go and have a look. But I found there were no people in it. There were a couple of city park staff who were shuffling around and mowing the grass. But otherwise it has become this very overgrown jungle and it, it felt dark and dangerous, even though the greatest danger probably was a dead tree falling in your head. Um, there was so much overgrowth, so much darkness. Um, it meant that the water and light didn't come down into the forest floor. So most of the flower beds were bare. And a lot of the planting of course had been done in the old days when it was a sunny exposed space. And now it's become largely a shaded park. So the plant species planted originally, the succulents, aloes, fakies, plants like that, uh, they died and they hadn't been replanted. So there was a lot of work to be done, but I just started slowly and um, just with what I could start with. Um, it was rather like exploring a, a giant overgrown haunted house. You can see from some of the buildings and structures, um, even they were very beautiful but overgrown and neglected and um, a little spooky. So there's a guy I work with, Tulani and Como, who is um, a great fearless gardener. Um, and Tulani and I have worked closely together. We just started slowly on weekends, just going in with a saw and an ax and just taking out first the dead branches. I've always been a tree pruner, I've done volunteer work in many parks around the city over the years doing that. And we just started pruning the trees to allow the light and the water to get to the forest floor, opening up lines of sight, because when you can see further, you feel safer. So I thought if I want to get people to walk back in the park again, they need to feel safe and they need to be able to see. Um, so it was kind of chopping and clearing. You can see the bottom left two photographs is the bottom is before and above is after. You can see how the view has opened up, how much more attractive it looks. And some of the branches down below have been cleaned up. And this also stops branches collapsing because what often happens is the branches carry too much weight. And in a, in a wild environment, that, that job would be done by, by antelope. Back, they would come and do the trimming for you. But here there's none of that. So the plants just become overgrown and um, too woody and um, too dark. And city parks responded. Um, I lobbied for them to expand their workforce at the park. And so we had lots more hands and so they could help now with the planting and taking away truckload after truckload of dead wood and starting to fix up some of the infrastructure um, and we start to make quite good progress. It's amazing how, how quickly nature responds. Um, so fairly, fairly quickly, it was, it was looking better. Um, we also hit the weeds in quite a big way. 
taking out those, dealing with the blackjacks and things, uh, planting up empty flower beds, seeding plants that need to get replaced. I started city parks mulching because they've been taking away leaves and taking them to the dump. So we started mulching the flower beds again, we started propagating the empty nursery. And, and we made great headway, and the park was starting to look a whole lot better. But it was three or four years into it, and I'd started to realize this is a bigger project. I'd started off trimming a few trees here and there and fixing up some cycads. And now it'd become a project that Lani and I were working every weekend on. But I couldn't even convince my friends to go to the park. The, the sense of fear around the wilds in Johannesburg was so big. Um, and fear is a difficult thing to overcome. If people are fearful of something, it's, it's almost impossible to get them past that. And I invite friends on the weekend and say, come and see this beautiful park. And they'd be like, oh no, no, not the wilds. And so I had to think imaginatively about what I could do, what would be the hook for people. And this is where the birds come in. So I'm an artist and I thought I can draw stuff. But drawings and paintings are not going to help me in a park like this. So what if I took a drawing and I cut it out of metal? And what if I hung that in a branch on a tree? So when people walk along, they look up and then they admire the tree. And the yellowwood trees in particular, I thought they were magnificent in the wilds. And I'd discovered so many of them um, that I wanted to share with people. But what if I did that? What if I did a whole bunch of these owls? So then I fundraised for it and I hung them in the trees for Mandela Day 2017. We did 67 owls and um, almost all of them are still there. Hung them high up in the branches so they'd be safe from harm. Um, I did all the drawings in charcoal. They were cut out um, by a company that co-sponsored it, Aluminium Trading. And the crowdfunding paid for the steel and the powder coating and the installation. And on that day in 2017, the people came back and that's how the car park looked. And it was chaos in a, in a wonderful way. This car park had been empty for, I don't know how long, years, decades. And suddenly people were interested again. And what the owls did was they created a photo opportunity that people could share on social media. They made a destination that people wanted to go to and they shared with their friends and their stories and it got them into the park. And then once we got people into the park, then we had a labor force. So then I could start to get people to help us. So we got donations of plants, <clears throat> we got donations of paint, we fixed up the park benches, people painted those in bright colors. And we had this endless labor force of, of volunteers. And so every weekend we'd have volunteer days and different projects going on. Also what I realized is that when people are involved and do the work themselves, then they feel a very strong sense of ownership of the space. So then they'll fight for it and they'll make sure that it doesn't get dilapidated again. So we've got now close on 10,000 people on the Facebook page. And a lot of those people have contributed to the park in, in some way. And I believe they will make sure that it's looked after going forward. We did some larger projects as well, restoration work. Um, the pathways had been amazingly built in back in the 1930s, but some of them had fallen apart, so we had to restore those. The bottom right-hand side, you can see the new entrance that we built. It was a really bad, patchy, slopey, eroded area before. And we redesigned this. We did a deal with Rodi in the school next door to use the stonework from an old wall they were take, taking down. And that wall now became a circular entrance area that groups could meet at. Uh, the Johannesburg Heritage Foundation gave it a blue plaque. We had the politicians there. Uh, we got signage. Hollard donated money towards doing signage and we made maps for the park. And then, then the, the infrastructure started to grow. Um, and with that came walking groups, special interest groups. We get a lot of birders now coming in, in groups, coming to um, look through the different habitats and, and spot the birds. Um, 
I started to expand the use of art through the park, not only my art, my own, also other artists' work, because I realized that art created focal points. So at the beginning, people were arriving in the park and they were walking from the car park to the owl forest. And then once they'd seen the owl forest, then they'd walk back down the hill and, and off they go. So I needed to use devices to get them to explore different parts of the park. That also helps us to open it up and to make it a safer space. Because what you want is people walking across the whole park and up and down all the pathways, because that makes the entire space safe, not just pockets of it. So I put the kudu, you can see top left there. Um, I placed that a bit up the hill, so people walked to the kudu. Uh, the bottom right picture is the Munro Drive gate, um, which was funded by a family in Joburg, and it's on the further, the easternmost point of the park, which is Munro Drive. And it was the centenary of building that road, so it seemed like the right time to do it. And I used aloes because I think aloes are a wonderful visual device and they're one of my favorite plants. And I popped an owl there. If you look in the middle of the gate, you can see a little owl. So we carried the, the bird theme all the way through. But it then created a destination for walkers to get to. So they'd park in the car park and then walk all the way across. It's about a kilometer to the easternmost point and get to the the aloe gate, um, and then we're back again. The pink giraffe is on the lawn, which is now called after it, um, giraffe lawn. I had to create names for things because names also help to get people moving around, help them to navigate the space, and that helps to make it safer as well. And the idea behind the giraffe was to make something big enough that could be seen from the main road outside. So Houghton Drive runs through the park, it cuts it in two, but 20 acres on either side. And there are thousands of cars driving along that road every day. But most of those people never even go into the park. Um, they never stop there, they don't know what it is. They just drive past a bunch of, of forest. So I wanted something that would catch their eye and make them wonder what was inside there. So in 2018, I crowdfunded to make a life-size giraffe. It's about five meters tall. Um, it sits inside a concrete base, which goes about a meter into the ground. You can see it just behind the photograph of the giraffe there. And we had a crane and trucks and things to do this. It was quite an operation. Um, the thing weighs a few tons. And the giraffe now stands proud in the middle of the lawn. And it, it again creates a destination, it creates a talking point, it creates a photo opportunity. So that photograph then of people standing next to the giraffe does the marketing for the park because that gets shared on social media and people want to go back and, and see it again and they want to bring their friends and, and so it gets shared. Um, I've also done other little projects like the ladybirds was <clears throat> sponsored by somebody in memory of a loved one. They run down a path which wasn't used much. I noticed nobody walked along that path. So what could I do which is subtle and will surprise people and delight them as they walk along? And so I worked with a, a mosaic artist, Drew Lindsay, and we came up with this idea of making little ladybirds. Um, which then becomes a thing which kids can count and they can spot some of them are hidden away. So most people have not even seen them. Um, and there's other art installations around the park now. There's various mosaic artworks. Um, there's a contemporary piece in the East, East Wilds by Gordon Froud. There's um, a lot of art now. And art helps to also to punctuate the landscape with color because otherwise it's a, it's a lot of green, but not everybody knows how to understand green. Um, rather like looking for birds, you, you look for little bursts of colour and that attracts and engages people's eyes and their brains. What I've become aware of more and more recently is how we have to conserve the habitats of the park. Um, it's a bit of a struggle keeping the water system going and um, that requires constant work. Grassland, um, I mentioned earlier, we don't have much high-fell grassland anymore, and the wilds only has pockets of it. So I've been trying to get city parks to stop cutting it down, to stop turning grassland into lawn, 
There are lawns, but lawns are a different thing to wild grasses. And wild grasses need to be allowed to seed, to grow to their full height. And that attracts certain kinds of birds and wildlife and mongoose and different things. So we, we need to conserve those grasses. So we've got to pay attention to the different zones within the park and how to make sure each is looked after. The bottom right is um, little tiny mushrooms. Um, fungi are a very important part of the ecosystem. And what I realized I did wrong at the beginning was we chopped out all that dead wood and had it shipped out to a dump or somewhere. I don't know where it went to. Um, we had to take out quite a lot of the dead wood because it was a fire hazard. But what I've been doing now is taking wood and just letting it lie in the forest, letting it decompose, allowing the, the, the plant life and the, and the fungi life to, to take over and to use those nutrients because that, that enriches the soil. And also I've realized that when you lay branches and pieces of wood across slopes, and we have a lot of slopes, that slows down the water flow. When you slow down the water flow, the water goes into the roots of the plants, so it benefits the plants. And it also helps to build better soils because there's less erosion. Um, it traps seeds from the plants, so the plants will then grow naturally. And so it's a very important part of, part of looking after the, the ecosystem. And then the flowering plants, like the aloes bottom left, and there's an amazing variety of, of indigenous flowering plants, which I think we often overlook as, as South Africans. We don't realize that things like Clivia and Agapanthus and Bigpanthus, which are popular all over the world, are indigenous to our country. So let's celebrate them, let's plant them up um, properly, and also plant them in a, in a natural way, not formal flower beds, but interspersing wild grasses, succulents, agapanthus, as they would be in the wild. Um, and then you get a much more natural aesthetic going across the landscape. But also I think the plants will feed off each other and, um, and you get more diversity, which in turn again benefits the birds and the and other wildlife, insects, etc. And this is a summer photograph. It looks a bit um, bleaker now because it's dry and so the, the grass turns yellow. Um, but you can see how amazing the forest cover is um, and how remarkable this is as a space to have so close to downtown. So you can see the Hillbrow Tower in the background there. Um, so you've got an incredibly dense urban area, less than a kilometer away from this 40 acre forest which is a remarkable thing. And uh, I spoke earlier about New York and Central Park and the, the parallels between that city and our city. And, and there are many, and, and, and the wild provides an example of um, what can be done, um, like happened in Central Park, when people take back a space and they fight for it and they make sure that the city does what it needs to do, but also they augment what the city is capable of doing. And many people don't realize that two thirds of the budget of Central Park, of the operating budget, is provided by donations from the neighbors. So I don't think we can look to the city to look after all of these green spaces. We have to take responsibility ourselves and where we have resources to, to use those um, and, and help to preserve and maintain. Um, and then we get these incredible spaces to, to look after and enjoy. It's a, it's a great pleasure for me when I see, particularly on weekends, how many people use the park now. You can see a few picnic groups in this photograph looking down there. But on, on weekends now, the car park is full all weekend. People walk from the surrounding suburbs. They park over the road at one of the schools and they, and they walk through. Um, people come from downtown, from the inner city areas. They come from the suburbs. It's a amazing meeting point of different groups of people. There are special interest groups, there are exercise groups, there are walking tours, there are all sorts of people who are, who are making use of it. Um, and that gives me great gratitude, but also gives me a sense of hope that it will get looked after going forward, um, you know, kind of whatever happens. 
And then finally, just to give you a, a sense of kind of what's what, if you're gonna go for a walk in the wilds, this is a map that I, I've had made up. And it's um, printed onto a board, which is at the entrance area. You can see running through the middle is, is Heart and Drive. It's got a busy road. There's a pedestrian bridge, which goes across that. On the left is the West Wilds. The West Wilds is the more park-like side. So this is used by, by most, most walkers will, will walk this side. Um, it's more popular because it's got lawns, it's got nice places to sit. It's cooler because the ridge runs east-west so that the West Wilds is south-facing. So even on a hot day, it's shady, it's cool, and, and it, it makes for a lovely walk. Um, there's also sufficient foot traffic that it's, it's safe every day of the week. Um, it's not unusual to see women walking there during the week on their own. Um, lots of dog walkers there. Dog walkers also help to keep the place safe. Um, quite a lot of sculpture installations um, and mosaic installations. So you can see those marked um, with the orange tabs. Um, there's Jock's View, which is a viewpoint we made in honour of Jock of the Bushveld because so Percy Fitzpatrick, while writing the book, was living at a house next door to the wilds, and he used to walk these ridges. Um, and various other points of interest um, all around the west, and you can see the, the lawn areas are marked in, in pale green. Then over the, over the bridge is the east wilds, and this is the side now where we need to pay more attention and start fixing it up more. The pathways need fixing up, we need more benches. And also we just need more walkers there. We need people to walk there in greater numbers because that makes it safe for everybody. Um, again, a lesson from Central Park is they use dog walkers by letting people run their dogs off leash. It opened up sections of the park that had been dangerous. Um, and the same thing happens in the wild. And we've got sufficient walkers who are walking their dogs off leash, um, even though technically you're not supposed to. It does help to make everybody feel safe because then there's a, a sense of, well, the dogs will sniff out any trouble. And there are lots of walking groups going across the East Wilds, especially on the, on the weekends. But you'll feel when you're there that because it's north facing, it's hotter, it's more exposed, there's less tree cover. So it's better to do that one um, in the morning or later in the afternoon uh, when, it's, when it's cooler. Um, there are various gates around the park. The main parking gate is, is the, the main public access, but neighbours have access to the key gates like the Kalani gate and Monroe Drive gate and uh, St John's gate. And the idea behind this, because it's such a big park, is to get local residents to use the park regularly. And so if they've got the key for a pedestrian gate near where they live, then they'll go in and out the whole time. And that happens um, particularly on the Kalani side, those gates can be very busy, um, even during the week, which is, which is wonderful. And there are some guides there to the, the walking distances, um, and we hope to carry on making more and more improvements. Um, and most importantly, we hope that the park carries on getting used by birders and walkers and exercisers and all different groups of people. Um, and those people will pay attention to looking after it, um, to reporting to city parks when things aren't right and making sure that we campaign to make sure stuff is fixed and to ensure that this park is looked after for successive generations. So that's my talk. I hope you enjoy it. Um, hope that you go back and enjoy walks in the wilds. And if you have a park near you, perhaps you can learn some lessons from this of um, what we can do together um, to improve our green spaces. Thank you. See Abulela, James. Thank you so much, James, for helping in keeping our inner city sanctuary interesting and giving refugee to our birds. If you enjoyed bird art, please make sure that you visit our silent auctions and bid for some of the available sales. James have donated his hour for the wilds and all the proceeds he helped to fundraise for the bird conservation work in South Africa. Let me take this opportunity in thanking the gold sponsors, 
Rico, Toyota, Boundless South Africa, Canon, and Swaros Optic for making this event possible. Talking of our sponsors, Swaros Optic, coming up next is the panel of discussion on bedding optics. Come find out from the experts if you need to know more about the binoculars. Otherwise, on FIDA 1, there'll be a showcasing of three African bedding destinations that you should visit. Thank you so much.